Let's put our hands together. Oh, Hamanate. Oh, Hamanate. Oh, Hamanate. Siaboga. Tando, Tando. I want to honor the Heartlines team. They're giving the attention to accomplish a unity here together today. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Thank you. And with that, I just want to say welcome to everybody. Thank you. Yeah, in the beginning, we want to declare something in the spirit. So before we start the the talking about what the family needs to be talking about. I want to ask the Spirit of God to be with us today. Can I see any hands who agree with that? There's a few hands. Amen. Can I please call, if you are a chairman of a fraternal, a chairman of a network of churches, Please come to the front. I was hoping for an amen or a hand clap. <laughs> Does anybody know that this moment has happened before? Can we testify of a moment before this? In this fashion, chairman of pastors, fraternals. Us. Right here in the beginning, I'm putting a challenge to all of us as chairmen, as leaders of the city. To give a, a trust to each other. In this way, um, we've got anointing oil here. Enough. While Pastor Victor is going to pray for the presence of the Lord today with us, all of us. And you are going to be praying for these leaders of the city, representing us in the city. They're going to anoint each other, pray for each other, bless each other with wisdom and with understanding. A super, supernatural understanding, an insight to the heart of God today, a special anointing for today. Uh, I think this is history in the making. Uh, as Khaira just said, it has never been seen. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, can we all just lift our voice and just pray for them? Let's just lift our voice and, and pray for them. Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before the throne of grace. We humble ourselves. Uh, Father, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. You are the one, my Father, who ordained this day. And we pray in the name of Jesus. You are the one who ordained this moment. And Father, we pray that you visit the city. Let the city be visited, O oh God. Use the servants that you have appointed to visit the city, my Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we give you praise, we give you honor, 
We give you glory. We give you praise. We magnify your name. We worship you, Lord. Father, thank you for using your servant, using hotlines, my Father, to bring this moment together and to pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that uh, you will be glorified in the city. You will be magnified in the city, my Father. Lord, it's you who can heal the land. And to pray, Father, we pray in your presence that you invite, be invited, my Lord, to visit the city with this man and woman. Uh, bring them before the throne of grace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves. We humble ourselves. We humble ourselves. And Heavenly Father, we pray for the city. If there is any sin that we have committed as a city, we are asking today, Lord, forgive the city. Let the blood of Jesus cover the four corners of the city in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That Heavenly Father, you will look at the city under the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, we give you all a praise. We give you all a praise. We give you honor and we give you glory. We magnify your name. Thank you, Jesus. I pray that the anointing on him will increase. Lord, that he will be amazed to see what you do. Thank you, Father, for him. Thank you for his heart all the years. In Jesus' name. That's good to see you. Thank you. Let the fire of revival begin to burn in the city that men and women will turn to God and Father that they will uh, return to the Father. Heavenly Father, your word says, can a nation turn to God in a day? We are praying that prayer that Father help the city return to God. Father, that we may do what you have called the city in the spirit realm to achieve. And Father, we bring all these men and women that are representing uh, churches and leaders, they are representing other men. Let your hand be over their life today. And Father, we commit this meeting today in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Victor Mokhotla, praise Tabernacle. Thomas Swift with the Tswane Inner City Church Leaders Forum and then also the Better Life Network of the AFM. Good morning, everybody. Reverend Soli Petla, a founder and a chairperson of Pretoria West the Pastors Forum. My name is Lesh Mashiro. I'm a pastor in the AFM in Mamelodi. A fraternal leader for Mamelodi Ministers Fraternal. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm El Elijah Mbete. I'm the chairperson of a bishop's council called Preeminence in the East Rand, but from Bronco Sprite. Thank you. Neville Norton from the Living Word Network. Good morning, everybody. The name is Ben Moachi, Mami Lodi Pastors Forum. The denomination is World Restoration Service. Thank you. My name is Josias Motlala, Chairperson of Pastors United Movement of South Africa, PUMSA, from Amaskla. Morning, everybody. My name is Jack Lucky Antoni. Spoken with Christian Ministries, and I'm here representing the Easterest Ministers Fraternal. Morning, everybody. I'm Archibald Malungwane, coming from Greater Harankua Council of Churches. Grace and peace to you all. My name is Anthony Marion. I'm from Lodium, the ministry that God has entrusted me with is Omega Family Ministries, and I also have a forum that the Lord has given me the vision. It's called CICF, Christ in a City Forum. Greetings, family. I'm Lucas Sitole 
from the fraternal called Christian Obedience Fraternal. We're operating in Social Nguve. Thank you. Greetings in the name of the Lord. I'm Thomas Tungwani. Actually, I'm the deputy chairperson of the fraternal called ARC. It's All Christian Community Association. So I'm standing on behalf of the chairperson because it's not available, but I'm the deputy chairperson. The ministry that I'm running is Faith Christian Bible Church. Thank you. Good day, brothers and sisters. I am Simon Mawela, the leader of Twani North Fraternal, being called Titlef. And I am pastoring a church in Soshanguve, Word of Faith Explosion Center. Good morning. I'm David Legalagala, Oliven Local Council of Churches, and also FBO Twani Chairperson. Good morning, Saints. Willem Bardnos from Orleda Park Association and Swane Leaders Forum. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. My name is Isaac Lomwane. I'm looking after a parish in Mamelodi called Evangelical Presbyterian Church, Swiss Mission, SFTM, standing for the truth. And here I'm representing our Ministers Fraternal Mamelodi Ministers Fellowship. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Jacob uh, Bushello, representing El Mapias Pastors Forum. Good morning. My name is James Mukola. I'm pastoring a church called Eldaba City Church. I'm, I'm the chairperson of Hamifo, Harankwa Ministers Forum in Harankwa. God bless you. Amen. Greetings to family of God. My name is Pastor Gone already. Sounds like I'm gone already, but I am here. Uh, I represent uh, the Lord Your Ministers Fraternal and I pastor Agape Family Ministries. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Brothers and sisters, my name is John Simons uh, from the Doxado Family Network and also a convener of the leaders of networks in our city and I just want to celebrate our partnership with Heartlines. What's been happening in this year is a massive breakthrough for our city. We love you guys. Thank you very much. The church is in the room. The church is in the room. Maybe one so that the world will believe that you sent me so that they may be one so that they may be completely one, in order that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as you love me. And then the next scripture in Ephesians, or in Psalms, Behold how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing. And then lastly, in Ephesians, it says, the church, you see, it's not the peripheral to the world. The world is the peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. The question I want to leave with every one of you this morning as we go through this interactive process that I'm so excited about. And thank you for Heartlines for facilitating this process for us. The question that I want to challenge you with is what does unity look like? What does unity mean? Is unity participation? I know a lot of fraternals get together and there's, there's wonderful work that happens in the city for even fraternal leaders to come together and spend time together. Is participation unity? I put to you that Amos 3.3 3 says that how can two men dwell together lest they agree? And it's the conviction of my heart that unity is not participation. Unity is agreement. The problem is what is it that we agree upon? Because there's so many things that we disagree about. 
you know, we've got a cooperation agreement with the AFM and we, we're very good friends. My dad and Dr. Isak has been good friends with personal friends for 50 years. But we don't agree on the baptism. And there's so many things that we disagree about. But what is it that we do agree about? And then when we realize what it is that we agree about, how do we work together to forward the agenda of what we agree about? And even more difficult, what do we do with people that don't agree with us? I had a very difficult, difficult conversation with one of my mentors a few weeks ago, leading up to today. And as I invited him to come and join us today, he looked at me and he said, why are we still talking about reconciliation so many decades after apartheid? Is that really still a thing? Do we really still need that? And the Lord just gave me the scripture in Romans 15 where it says, We who are strong must be considerate for those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves, but we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. And then in verse 5 it says, May God who gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for the followers of Christ Jesus. What the Lord has called us for is a ministry of reconciliation. Somebody once asked me the question, for how long do we still need to reconcile? To which my answer was, we have the privilege to live the ministry of reconciliation for as long as someone's hurting, for as long as someone's offended. That's the privilege we were get given to reconcile man with God. And I want to challenge you this morning. Let's agree on that one thing. Let's agree on that one thing. When we got together as fraternal leaders and church and network leaders at, at the bridge workshop, um, there was a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts. And there's a lot of things that we differed on. But if there was one thing that we agreed upon, it was that. Can I get an amen for those of you who were there? Pastor Lesh, it was such a blessing to have you in my group. We come from different generations, different ways of thinking. But there's one thing that we agree upon, is that we need to be one. Because the problem is that in society today in South Africa, from Monday to Friday, we are forced to work together. But on a Sunday, we can do what we want. And I bow my head in shame that the church right now is the least integrated part of our society. And that blame lays at our door. It's in front of our door. And it starts here today with us. Let's just take a moment and just allow the word to come and work in our hearts. And this wasn't scripted and this wasn't planned, but I have to just follow the unction of the Holy Spirit. So forgive me for going a little off script. Pastor Lesh, can I ask you to just come and pray for us and ask the Lord to allow his word to come and change our hearts. Is that fine? Sorry for putting you on the spot. I just really feel in my heart that this is what the Lord wants to do this morning. Close our eyes. Almighty God, we thank you for your grace this morning. Thank you that as the day starts, you have already, you have already given us doses of your mercy. And we thank you in Jesus' name for that. We pray, Lord, now that your spirit will move into the hearts of every man and, and woman in this place to give us wisdom, understanding, and foresight that as we go on in this life, will do that which is your will. I pray for my brother as he's ministering this morning that you'll fill him with your spirit, wisdom, work in his mind, and they will put your words and anointing on his tongue for the glory of your name. We thank you this morning that everybody in this house shall be filled with the wisdom of the word of God. And the spirit of God will put in our hearts that which you have intended for this day. I pray for all this, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 
Then you reply, yes, you are the body of Christ. Yes, I am the body of Christ. Please say with me, you are the church. I am the church. Yes, you are the church. You are right, I am the church. Can I have an amen? amen? Now look the person in the eye and tell them, brother, sister, today I want to understand you. Please say it again, brother, sister, I want to understand you. Please share your heart with me. I want to listen. With love, with my heart. I'm going to try and put my mind at rest and put my heart in front. I want to understand you more. If you agree, please shake hands, tell them you love them, and let's go. Tell them let's go. Heartlines is an organization not a church. We are not represented by anybody in this room. We don't have churches. We don't have fraternals. Edgar, just stand up and wave at least, because when I say us, at least that they know. That's Ed. He's with Heartlines. He's with me for the day. And we are here to, not to lead you. I can guarantee you, we are not, as Edgar and myself, Heartlines, we are not here to lead you. We want to serve you. There's a need. There's a breach that's not completed. And we hope that we will leave here today with a plan that we can actually agree that we'll go to the breach and do something about that incompleted breach. Beyond the River is a movie that Hotlines was key in making the storyline. It's a true story from South Africa, and the two main characters is, is Duma and Steve. And some of you have seen the movie, and it's a great discussion starter to say, not everything is always going that well. Actually, we are frustrated at some, some stages. Um, and as a family, we all know, me and my wife, my children, we are frustrated with each other because it's not going according to what we agreed, or what we know is better, what is right. So we are family, and sometimes we feel a little bit like Duma and Steve. I wanted to talk about uh, canoeing. I've been trying everything that I can, you know, working hard, so that I can be a good partner to you. I mean, we have one bad time trial and you're like, hey, hey, we must give up, this is useless. I mean, come on, Plastif. It's not just the time trial, Duma. You know, I partnered with Eddie for so long, everything became easy. You know, we knew what each other was thinking, what each other was doing. We didn't have to explain anything. It's like we had our own language. You're the one who said, Uguti, in your K2, we must become like one person, and why not? You, know, you, you like pretending like young ass, but you don't know me. Oh, and you know me. Not everything, but I know some things. I know your name is Stephen Andrews. I know you have a wife called you Annie. I know where you stay. I know you're a teacher. I know what car you drive. I even know that you have a dog. Just because you know those things about me doesn't mean that you know me. Yeah, but what do you know about me? Do you know where I live? Do you know what my situation is? Do you know who my father is? Do you know who my family is? Uh, what do you know about these things? Nothing. Nothing. Zero. Do you even know what my surname is, Prastif? People feel frustrated. They feel misunderstood, disrespected. They feel put in a box. People feel sometimes that they are labeled, treated as objects, something that can be moved around. People feel frustrated. And people feel they don't know me. 
Can we agree that sometimes we feel they don't know me? They don't know me, but they assume and they act as if they know me. Can we have trust if people make assumptions about you? So we need to understand each other to grow trust. In South Africa, we've got a reality. We're not in Europe, we're not American, we are South African. Are we South Africans? Do we have a history? Is it a reality? We can wish it away, but will it go away? We have a reality. And that reality is that part of our history is apartheid. Is it true? It's true. And the church played a role in that history. The church were there. The church played a role. Maybe good, maybe bad. But the church were there. The question today is, do we have a responsibility? Is it our problem? Do we need to do something about it? The past is the past. Can we just move on and make as if it didn't happen? And we want you to share your hearts today about your feelings, about where we are and where we come from. If we are a family, the body of Christ, I am the church, you are the church. If we are family, we need to talk to each other. And we all know as families, sometimes we have to have a very difficult, uncomfortable meeting. Am I right? We want to understand today how you feel. And Ed and myself is going to try and pull it from you so that everybody can hear it and that we can find each other. Because understanding somebody brings trust. Some level of trust. And we need to build trust. To some extent, I want to say today is not a day for being politically correct. Because as a family, we don't always talk nicely to, to each other. We need to be straight. We also don't need to talk about and try and be factually correct. Those things are important. But sometimes if we're politically correct, we don't really say what we want, what we need to say. In love and care front, confront the truth and talk about it. We don't love enough to talk about the truth. And also facts. According to who? We need to go and check the facts. So let's rather not talk about facts. Let's talk about how we feel, where we are, where we come from. What is our frustrations? If we're going to go together, what do we need to talk about before we go together? We want to know how you feel. You can see the bridge. Can you see the bridge? Is it finished? What is the purpose of a bridge? It's not a monument. It's something that needs to be used. But that bridge, as you can see, is not completed. Am I right? No. If we leave it there for the, for the next 25 years, and nobody does anything about it, can we just go past and say, hmm, the bridge is complete, although it's not. Just time has passed, but it's still not fixed. We can still see it the same way that we left it. How close are we together? And there's one or two uh, just pictures that I want to leave us as we, we, we start this discussion, uh, this dialogue. Can I please have uh, Ben, please join me? Um, oh, Arman, you said no. Willem, please come help me. It's just a, a picture of understanding. Willem, please stand here at this chair butt and look to the other side. Just look to that side. And Ben, you look to that side. Are they together? They're not even aware of each other. 
They're not, not together. They're actually not even aware of each other. And he continues with his life. And, and Ben is continuing with his life. Blissfully unaware of each other. Is that where we need to be? No. Please look, turn around and look at each other. Wave at each other, please. Are they together? Okay, let's ask the question again. Are they together? Uh, please wave again. Uh, uh, they can't see you. They are waving at each other. Aren't they together? No. All right, please come and stand right here in, the, in, in front of me and, and hug each other in the sense of look that side. Or, well, you, okay, go for it. <laughs> are they a little bit more together now? Yes. That's more what we need. Am I right? Yes. Now, that is between a white brother and a black brother. Oh, yeah. um, can we just say, Lord Jesus, help us that we can get to togetherness? Thank you, Ben. Uh, please stay with me. Thank you, Willem. Um, I need another black brother. Um, Solly, please come. Uh, please go and stand on your well, on Willem's side, this side, and look away, and also look away to that side. We've got two black brothers. Are they aware of each other? No. Are they together? No. They're not. Please turn around and wave at each other. Are they together? So there's two levels that we need to talk about. There's absolutely, in the context of South Africa, a white and black discussion, dialogue, talk that we need to have. Am I right? But then there's also, you are from Mamalodi, you are from uh, West uh, Pretoria, they're at Atridgeville, and you, both of you were at the bridge, so you do know each other. But have you had a coffee afterwards? We don't know each other. We're not even aware of each other. And we come to meetings, we wave, and then we go to our own agendas, our own work, and then we wave again. Waving, going to meetings, is not necessarily. Please come together and show us a picture of... Uh, we need the church to be more like that. So our desire... Thank you both pastors. You can, you can please have a seat. It's just a simple thing, but... This is what we want. Um, and we need to talk about it because at this point we are not exactly there. So how close are we? Is the breach complete? The answer is we have work to do. And what I want to make clear from my perspective, and Ed can and comment on that if he, if he needs to, we are not on the breach with gloves and machines working the breach, fixing the breach. We are not. We are standing on the riverbed, looking at the bridge, talking about a bridge that's incomplete. We are not on the bridge yet. We are just talking about, we realize, we observe, there's a dream, and it's not complete. And we, we need to agree, we need to talk about, are we going to put on gloves and go together to the bridge and take the machinery and finish this bridge. What would your answer be if I'm asking, can we talk today about what it will take to go and build the bridge of reconciliation? Not just between white and black, but definitely about that, but also between different areas in the city that's not talking to each other, blissfully unaware of each other, doing their own things, not being different parts of the same body. So let's just think about that. And as we talk, talk into that direction. Eka, you're almost up. I'm going to play a clip and then introduce yourself and go for it. Let's have a look. I am not black. I mean, that's what the world calls me, but it's not me. I didn't come out of my mother's womb saying, hey everybody, I'm black. No, I was taught to be black. And you were taught to call me that, along with whatever you call yourself. It's just a label. See, from birth, the world force feeds us these labels. And eventually we all swallow them. We digest and accept the labels, never ever doubting them. 
But there's one problem. Labels are not you and labels are not me. Labels are just labels. But who we truly are is not skin deep. See, when I drive my car, no one would ever confuse the car for me. Well, when I drive my body, why do you confuse me for my body? It's my body. Get it? Not me. Let me break it down. See, our bodies are just cars that we operate and drive around. The dealership we call society decided to label mine the black edition, yours the Irish or white edition. And with no money down, 0% APR and no test drive, we were forced to own these cars for the rest of our lives. Forgive me, but I fail to see the logic or pride in defining myself or judging another by the cars we drive. Because who we truly are is found inside. Listen, I'm not here to tell you how science has concluded that genetically we're all mixed and race in the human species doesn't exist or how every historian knows that race was invented in the 15th century to divide people from each other and it has worked perfectly. No, I'm not here to lecture. I just want to ask one question. Who would you be if the world never gave you a label? Never gave you a box to check? Would you be white, black, Mexican, Asian, Native American, Middle Eastern, Indian? No, we would be one. We would be together. No longer living in the era of calling human beings black people or white people. These labels that will forever blind us from seeing a person for who they are, but instead seeing them through the judgmental, prejudicial, artificial filters of who we think they are. And when you let an artificial label define yourself, then my friend, you have chosen smallness over greatness and minimized yourself, confined and divided yourself from others. And it is an undeniable fact that where there is division, there will be conflict and conflict starts wars. Therefore, every war has started over labels. It's always us versus them. So the answer to war, racism, sexism, and every other ism is so simple that every politician has missed it. It's the labels. We must rip them off. Isn't it funny how no baby is born racist, yet every baby cries when they hear the cries of another? No matter the gender, culture, or color, proving that deep down we were meant to connect and care for each other. That is our mission, and that is not my opinion. That is the truth in a world that has sold us fiction. Please listen, labels only distort our vision, which is why half of those watching this will dismiss it or feel resistance and conflicted. But just remember, so did the caterpillar before it broke through its shell and became the magnificent butterfly. Well, these labels are our shells and we must do the same thing so we can finally spread our wings. Human beings were not meant to be slapped with labels like groceries and supermarkets. DNA cannot be regulated by the FDA. We were meant to be free and only until we remove them all and stop living and thinking so small will we be free to see ourselves and each other for who we truly are. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you heard earlier, my name is um, Ed Ramsamy. I currently serve as the National Director for Youth for Christ South Africa. Many of you will know our organization. We have a rich history here in our country, and not just in our country, but across the world as well. And, uh, but today I'm serving on behalf of Heartlines, and uh, I've been involved with Heartlines right from the very beginning uh, when we started with the whole proposition of saying we want to help people become people who are living out their values. Um, now, you would all understand, right, that value shapes behavior. True? And so I want to ask us this morning, as we've gathered here, leaders of churches in this beautiful city of Shwani, what's your value? Do you value the very thing that we've been talking about for the last little while? Do, if, because if you value it, you will live it. If you value reconciliation every single moment, the illustration that Gerard just showed us with those brothers, you will live that. You see, but the problem is there's this thing that, that we call, what I call silent debate. You saw the video clip. It's all about labels. We label people. We all do it, don't we? Uh, ladies do it a little bit more than men. Just let me help you out here. 
So I do this workshop called Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti. Because men, we like all our stuff in little neat little boxes, right? It must be in that box, and then we deal with it, and then we go to that box. Women are like spaghetti. Everything is in groot gemos. It's all in gemengel, and everything's connected. But what I learned from ladies, and this is such an important thing, is that when men walk into a room and they walk in and they greet each other and they go, Hi, my name is Ed. Broer. Nice Gerard. to meet you, Gerard. Broer. Yes. I know in Pretoria when you get greeted. Broer. And we look at each other, and it's probably about three seconds, Marcus. It's probably about three seconds. I look at him and I go, Right, yeah, cool. But ladies, it's a little bit different. They'll look at each other, and they'll probably take about five seconds, right, ma'am? But maybe even more, you're right, thank you. Maybe 10 seconds. And they will, what I call the scan. And they'll look up and down, and they'll look from side to side. See that sister is nodding her head, yes. Yes, tell the truth. Shame the devil, tell the truth. They scan, and then they go, hmm, 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 hmm. Now this is all happening silently, right, in their mind. They're not saying it out loud. No, 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 no. But here's what they're thinking. Guys, can I let you in on a little secret? Here's what they're thinking. Yo, yo, yo. What was that sister thinking? Mm, mm, mm. How could she wear something? Either it's too short, it's too long, it's too tight, it's too loose. And then my favorite, my favorite, recently I heard this, my favorite is, should a lady her age be wearing that? And then the older ones, they go, oh, these young ones. And we have this silent debate. We have it about the way people dress. We have it about the way people look. And can I be honest? I want to make a confession. I did that once. I judged someone. I'm standing in our local Caltex. I'm grabbing a coffee from the Seattle coffee shop. And while I'm standing, when I walk in, I notice that there's a stunning Ferrari. Man, it was smart. It was red. It had those white leather seats. The top was down. I was looking. Now, I wasn't coveting. Don't judge. I was just admiring. And then I thought, man, I'd love to know who the owner of this car is. Maybe I could get a ride. And I walk in, and here's what I did. I see two gentlemen waiting for their coffee. The one guy was dressed really smart. I mean, like, really smart, like Pastor Neville, you know, smart. Had the jacket, the, you know, just looked really smart. And then there was another guy that looked a little bit scrawny. I mean, we are in Pretoria, so I have to be contextual, right? He looked a bit, he, he had a tattered shorts. His T-shirt had a hole or two in it. And then he had this, you know, he had this key ring, and on the key ring was a Ferrari emblem. And I'm thinking, while I'm waiting for this, I'm thinking, definitely not the driver of the car, but he's living with faith. He's got the key ring. <laughs> and then I think it must be the older gentleman because, you know, he's got the jeans, he's got the sports jacket, silver hair, looks so smart. He had a little car next to him. I even made up a backstory for the little kid. I was like, oh, that's probably his kid from probably his third marriage or something, you know, Lot Lamaki. <laughs> to my surprise... The two gentlemen walk up. The guy with the smart jacket and the jeans got into his Hyundai accent. <laughs> and the guy with the shorts and the T-shirt got into the Ferrari. Friends, I want to ask you, how often do we do that? And, and, even in the church, like Marcus reminded us. Now, we judge. And that, that video clip that you saw... We look at people and we go, no, you're too young, you're too old, you're too this, you're too that. I, Jean, this happened to me the other day. <laughs> I'm, I'm in my hometown, Itegwini, Durban, obvious. I mean, look, he's nodding his head going, obvious. Yeah. Obvious. <laughs> uh -uh, uh -uh, that's not nice. But I'm home <laughs> in Durban, and I'm at this church. It's a church event, so we all like, you know, we do this thing or whatever, and I obviously speak like I'm now... And this brother comes up to me, Neville, and he says to me, one of the local preachers, and he comes up and he greets me, he goes, and, and, and he, he goes, you speak so eloquently. Now, that's a big English word, even for me. So I look around, and I'm with some friends, and then he walks away, and a friend looks at me, he goes, hey, what do you think the guy meant? Why did he have to say you speak so eloquently? Like, really? You know what he was saying? Really, what he was saying? Because this is the thing with silent debate. You've got to hear the message behind the words. You know what he's really saying? <laughs> Where's Bukata? This is what he was saying, bro. He says, yo, for an Indian, <laughs> you speak very nice English. <laughs> and all. <laughs> I 
What he was really trying to say to me was this. He goes, man, you don't sound like all the local Durban Indians. You're not even shaking your head when you talk. <laughs> and so what does he say? You speak so eloquently. You see, these are the kind of debates that are going on. And even, and I'm sad to say, and this is why we do the work we do, even in the church. And so I want to ask us this morning, there's this great story we tell as hotline. Some of you may have heard it already, but I, but I really want to say it again. Uh, so so the, there's this time in Rome where the, the Jewish people and the Catholic Church was having this, this fight. The Jewish Church and the Catholic people were having this fight, and so they decide to have a debate. And they said, right, whoever wins the debate is going to be able then to, you know, the Jews can stay in Rome because the Catholics wanted them to leave. Bishop, you know, the bishops and the Pope weren't happy and they said, right, but here's what we'll do. We'll have this debate between the Jewish people and the Catholic Church and whoever wins gets the, the you know, if the Catholics win, the Jews must leave. If the Jews win, they can stay in Rome. They all agree. So they go back to their own quarters. All the Jewish people get together in the synagogue in Rome. And they say, right, who's going to stand up against the Pope and debate? And no one. You know, they're like, no, 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 no. And then the one guy, he's the cleaner, Moshesh. Moshesh says, hey, I'll do it. And they all look at Moshesh and they go, really? Okay, the, okay, cool. He comes, he stands, and there's the Pope and there's Moshesh. Pope starts, puts his hand up, and he says, because the challenge was that they could have this debate, but they had to have it in silence. Can you imagine how many of us would really struggle with that? You can have a debate with someone, but you're not allowed to speak. I would never be able to do that. So the Pope stands up, and this is what he does. He starts, it's a silent debate, stands up, and he goes. Moshe looks at this, thinks for a moment, and he goes. Pope's like, wow. Taken aback, he steps back, he goes. Moshe looks, thinks for a moment again, strokes the chin, and he goes. The Pope was even more startled. He goes. He summons the cardinals and the bishops and he has them bring out the holy sacrament of the bread and the wine and he has it laid out, the Eucharist laid out in front of him and he then you know, holds up the bread and he holds up the glass of wine and he takes a glass and then Moshe looks at this and shakes his head, reaches into his bag and he pulls out an apple. And the Pope steps forward and he says, the Jews have won the debate, they get to stay in Rome. And there's great cheering, and the Jewish people get all excited. They go and lift Moshe up. They put him on their shoulders, and they march him out of the, you know, the cathedral, and they walk to the synagogue, and everybody's happy. They get back to the synagogue, and they say, Moshe, Moshe, what happened? And the Catholics go to the Pope, and they said, what happened? And the Pope says, well, here's what happened. We started the debate, and I said, there is only one God. To which he then turned around and said, you know, God, you know, there's only one God. And he said, no, but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He said, we're going to round up all the Jews and we're going to run you out. And Moshe said, we are standing right here. We're not going to move. And then what happened? And the Pope said, I did the most amazing thing. I, I brought out the elements, the bread and the wine to symbolize man's sinfulness and the forgiveness that is in the blood of Christ. And what did Moshesh do? He took out an apple to remind us of the fall of man and the depravity of man from the beginning and that we are all sinful in the sight of God. And so I couldn't argue with that and they won. But while over at the synagogue, hold on, hold on, it gets better. Over at the synagogue, there's cheering and adulation. Everyone's kind of chanting, Moshe, Moshe. And they said to him, but so what happened? Tell us, tell us. All we could see was the signal. He goes, well, it was strange. Because the Pope said, you know, in one day, we're going to round you up. And he said, no, not one day will we move. He said, you know, within three days, he says, you know, all we're going to round you up and move out. He says, we're going to stand right here. He says, and then the Pope did something strange. He brought out his lunch. 
And so I took my lunch out. Because I thought that's what we were doing. You see, friends, this is what happens so often with us. And when it comes to that, and I was thinking, and, and, and I'm going to just wrap with this before I hand back over to Gerard. There's a moment where Jesus, in Luke chapter 15, it's a fascinating passage of Scripture, by the way. In Luke 15, you know, we always look at the story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. But the first few verses, for me, is so pivotal to reconciliation as well. Because Luke 15 talks about the ultimate reconciliation that Christ came to secure for us. The Bible talks about how we were separated from God right from the very beginning of time. In the Garden of Eden, we became separated from God. Therefore, we needed to be reconciled with God. And when Jesus came and lived on this earth, you know where we find Jesus with the people who God was reaching out to to be reconciled with? And Luke 15 says he was spending time with sinners, with tax collectors, the people that the rest of the religious people had just pushed to the margin. And they say to these disciples, why is your teacher spending time with these people? And what does Jesus do? He begins to build a bridge. He says, the Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. And then one of my favorite stories... Mark chapter 2. It's the story of those men who bring their friend to Jesus. You remember it? You should remember it. Okay, a few, okay, I'm getting really worried about the church in Shawnee. Do you know the story of the guys who rip open the roof and lower their friend to Jesus? I had to give you a bit more, right? Yeah, yeah. So they rip open, they lower their friend to Jesus. Two things about that passage. Verse 5, chapter 2, verse 5 says, When Jesus saw their faith, not so much the guy on the mat. He had faith. Yes, he trusted. We're talking about trust. He trusted. Yes. But the Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, he healed the man. And while they were there in this house, and remember the reason they had to go through the roof is because the house was so full. There was no place through the doors. There was no place through the windows. They had to become something to open the roof. But do you notice something in that story? There are men, religious men, standing inside this room. And they're thinking in their minds, silent debate, they're thinking, who does this man think he is? That he can, number one, forgive sins, that he can heal. And Jesus says to them, why do you think these things? So I want to ask you, what's the silent debate going on in the inside of you? What are the things going on in the inside of me? Do we still judge? Do we still hold to certain beliefs? Because when it comes to this incomplete bridge, friends, I think that's one of the things that's causing us to still have this incomplete bridge because we look and we're suspicious. We look and we're cautious. We look and we judge. And I want you to say this with me. It's something that I've been saying time and time again. If you were with the bridge, if you were at the day at Moraletta when we were together with Mar Say this with me. Different, Different is, not is not wrong. Okay, one more time. Different, Different is, not wrong. is not wrong. As we sit here this morning, there is a rich diversity. There is both gender, male, female. There is so many different races. I praise God for it. We are all represented here. I love the worship. We were talking about it earlier. I loved that worship. I even sent it to my Facebook followers. Because I said, hey, you get a foretaste of heaven. The Bible says in Revelation, people from every tribe, every nation, every town will gather around the throne and they will worship and declare glory to him. And we got a foretaste of that. So we got to worship together. We've got to suspend. And I want to ask you, what is it that you and I need to suspend as we continue through today? It was different, but it different is not wrong. Because when Jesus looks at us, he doesn't see the difference. He sees the heart. Can I do one more illustration, Gerard, before I hand over to you? I'm going to be generous. You've never seen an Indian actually give money, have you? you no. So today, I'm going to, hold on, can I make sure, can we just invoice this, I'll make sure I get it back. 
not sure who I'm going to end No, not Levin of Worth. I'm talking about Heartlines. Yeah, yes, fine. It's not offering time, by the way. <laughs> so this is a 100 Rand note, okay? Can you just verify that? No, no, don't. Just look. <laughs> we'll talk about trust later. But, okay, so you see, it's, all, it's a legit, legit. Yeah? Danny? It's legit. Yeah. It look, uh, it's, super. it's legit. Okay, one Madiba. Okay, do you want it? Okay, hands up, hands up. Who wants it? Yeah, okay. Cool. Okay, do you still want it? Hands up. Yo. Hold on. Okay, do you still want it? Hands up. Who still wants it? My goodness. You people are disgusting in Pretoria. Seriously. Why do you still want it? You still want it, Sissy? After everything I've done to it. Why? But why? Yes? Like, it's still, it's still, you're sure? I noticed some hands went down. But what surprised me, and this has never happened in any of the other cities, it is the first time, and sir, so you are moving towards a holy city. It is the first time white people left their hands up when it got to this stage. In all the other cities. The moment we get to this part, the Molungas are like, oh, we're out. Uh -uh, no, we're done. We're done. Uh -uh. Uh, you keep your... Uh -uh, uh -uh. Uh -uh. Hey, but the comrades, yo. Uh, it's 100. No matter what I do on the outside of this note, the value never changes. Now, if I can do that with a 100 no rand note... How much more when God looks at you? No matter what label people have put on you, no matter how people have judged you, no matter what people have said to you and about you, when God looks at you, He sees someone who's fearfully and wonderfully made. He sees someone who is not going to be the label. Yes, I, I, have, I am male. Yes, my race is Indian. My denomination is Baptist. But my language is English. I support Kaiser Chiefs. You look at that and you think, ah, oh, you've got something different. But when God looks at me, He sees me through the cross as someone who is redeemed, set free, justified, in the process of sanctification. You wanted it, you can have it. Make sure you tithe on that, please. Please don't sit. Thank you, Ed. Cool. Tell us a bit, uh, what is the Hotline's leadership bridge? Yes. Just shortly. Cool. So the bridge, I, I love this. It's a, a couple of years ago, just before we started this whole campaign, we were thinking about uh, what I like to call a framework. You know what a framework is? Like a little blueprint of how to do it. And so we, we came up with this idea of bridge, that God ultimately was bridging you know, between man and God. And I love to tell the story because a lot of people look at me and they say, hey, but hold on, hold on. Why Christianity? Why did you take that step? Because for me, number one, the first thing about the bridge that we have to talk about is the bridge between God and man. Friends, in every world religion, it's man trying to reach God. It's man thinking, how many times can I pray a day or in a week? It's man doing. But yet in Christianity, it is God who loved man that he sent Jesus. And built that ultimate bridge. So that's the first thing. And then we got talking about it. But the bridge between us. And one of the things they tell us, that when you look at a bridge, there's four fundamental things that need to happen. Number one, number one is that you've got to clear away obstacles that exist. You remember the example earlier? The two gentlemen were standing here, and there are obstacles in the way. And it could be a whole lot of stuff. We've mentioned some of them already. We look at each other, we see the racial difference. We look at each other, we see the gender difference. We look at each other, we see the language difference. 
And even for us within the church, there's even the denominational differences that we hold to, the example you gave. And so number one, we've got to clear away those. Before you can even begin to build a bridge, friends, you've got to then clear away those obstacles. How can we dwell together? We talked about Amos. <laughs> and yet we quote those scriptures, we preach these messages, but yet we still have those obstacles between us. Number two, and this for me is fascinating, we, we, and, and the movie Beyond the River illustrates this so well. We've got to begin something called simultaneous construction. Say that with me, simultaneous construction. You see, you can't just have one place. And that was what young Duma was telling Bro Steve. He was saying, Bro Steve, I come to you and I train. I come to you at the time you want. I know everything about you. I know your name. I know your surname. I even know that you have a dog, which he was scared of. But he turns and he says, but Bro Steve, do you even know my surname? Do you know where I live? Do you know my family? And so, friends, so here's the thing. When it comes to this whole idea of simultaneous construction, it has to happen that we both start sharing. And this is something that we're driving through with all our, our programs and all our stuff. We're saying, let's use it. And the story, the stories that we share, we begin to know about each other. We begin to find out, you know my name, but do you know my story? Thirdly, so number one, you've got to remove the obstacles. Number two, you've got to do simultaneous construction. Number three, you've got to focus, and especially for us as the church, we've got to focus on the correct keystone. That Christ in us. And so for me, when I focus on that, I look at it, and Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, that God is busy reconciling man to himself through Christ. And he has given us that ministry of reconciliation. And then he ends that, and he says, be, you can almost, I, I get a sense that Paul has almost heartfelt appeal. Paul saying, be reconciled. And for me, that's the correct a keystone. The keystone was that pivotal part of a bridge. It's that center part. And if you remove the keystone, the whole thing falls. And for me, if we declare him as Lord, and we declare the lordship of Christ of our lives and of our church and our community, then Christ has to be that central figure. And then number four, there's got to be maintenance of that bridge. There's got to be ongoing care. And that's why the resources that we've developed at Heartlines become such a crucial thing in this space because there's material, there's resource, there's stories, there's ways that you can do it, there's messages you can preach, small group material that you can run. There's days like today. And I'm sad, I'm really sad, Marcus, that there was this friend of yours that asked a question like that or made a statement like that. Isn't it sad that even now, we, why are we still talking about reconciliation? And I, I love to get asked that question, and I wish I was sitting with you and I would have said things like, you know why? Because as recently as February 2019, I'm sitting, I'm doing a workshop, it was a corporate workshop, I'm sitting doing a workshop, and a lady raises her hand and she says, I want to tell a story. It happened just a few days before we were at the workshop. It was a weekend. All the family were out, and the little kids were playing. You know the little play areas at some of the eating places? And these kids were playing, and all the little kids had, you know, Oros, Oros has got those little bottles now, right, with little like, kind of sippy cup things. She said all the kids were playing, and they were drinking the Oros bottle, and they put it down, and the one little kid, and I hate using these descriptions, but it's powerful for the story. A little, a little white girl puts it down, a little Macy kid. And she puts her bottle down and, you know, the kids are playing and kids are kids. And then a little black child picks up the bottle to take a sip from it because she's thirsty. That little girl's mom rushes over to the child, pulls it out of her hand. And the lady's tearing up as she's telling the story. And she said, you know what, Ed, I would have been okay with that if, if the mom had kind of just wiped the bottle or just cleaned it and gave it back to her child. No. She said, the mom took the bottle and she threw it in the bin. That's why, Marcus, in 2019, the church must still preach about reconciliation. It's because there's fought, because those same people 
They'll walk in a church on Sunday morning. And they will sing, you are the way maker, you are the miracle maker, you are the God of gods. They will worship him with their mouth, but when they walk out the doors, they live in a way that doesn't show his value. So we've got to clear away the obstacles. We've got to do simultaneous construction. We've got to focus on the keystone, the correct keystone, and we've got to continually be maintaining. And this is why we do. This is why we took some pastors away. This is why we're building into the church. This is why we're making the resources available. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Let's not just preach it, but let's live it in our words and in our actions. Amen? Amen. 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 We took about 30 pastors away for two days, the 13th and the 14th of August. Of August ne? It feels long ago. To Mielström. And we spent two days talking intensively, deliberately about the things that Edgar just mentioned. Two days. We slept over. We started early in the morning. We went into the night, and the next morning, we started again. They'd done some good work for us, deliberating, talking, finding each other on our behalf. It was a good group, a good, well-represented group. This is awesome. And what I want us to do today is to pull from their experience, because they've shared something and time that we, we can't give. We are here together, so let's draw from them. So we want to honor and acknowledge you that this is the group of pastors, leaders, who went and built some bridges and talked about the bridge that's incomplete. So when, when we started the, uh, the first day of the two-day process, um, we asked the participants that you see up here with us now, uh, what are your expectations? What are, what are you hoping to achieve after we had kind of set it up and told them what the journey was going to be? What are your expectations for the two days? And so the, the, the strong sense was that we want to build a network. Uh, there were some existing relationships in the room, but also a strong desire to build new relationships, which again is the body of Christ. We, we were excited. The whole idea of building bridges, um, which was the theme obviously of the two days. Um, and then also an expectation of forgiveness. That, and I think we said it earlier today as well, that a lot of stuff had happened in the past. Uh, the church, sadly, was on both sides of that story. And so what is it that we need to do again as the body to forgive and to move forward? And so there was a strength of that. To follow Jesus was an expectation around forgiveness. We also said we want to create a strategy, uh, which today is part of that. And so we're really excited that one of our expectations set out then, we're already living... Uh, a local strategy for Shwani, but also that that ripple effect would move across the nation uh, in partnership with people like ourselves at Hotlines. Uh, an expectation is the art of seeing good in other people. Uh, you remember my story about judging, value. I mean, I see value in you. I see you the way God sees you. And so I think that was achieved. The art of simple living, um, that again, we're not living extravagantly, we're not living beyond our means, but there's that simplicity that Christ calls us to uh, and to live the way he would want us, an expectation of unity. Um, and for me, that's such a strong thing to, in the midst, again, we said it, we want to celebrate our rich diversity, but we want to be unified. We, we, we are one. Uh, you quoted John 17 earlier, that Jesus prayed, Father, I pray that as we are one, that they may be one. Uh, it was our expectation on the day. Uh, ideas to empower the local church and the leaders, uh, rec reconciliation, uh, we wanted to see the, you know, amongst the under-resourced churches as well. So it's not just a race thing. It's not just a black-white thing. But even within our communities, Afrikaans, English, Portuguese, you know, it, even within the communities, uh, black, different tribes, different clans coming together. So how do we, f how do we facilitate that reconciliation? Uh, we wanted to see inclusivity in our local churches. Again, the comment, you know, has often been made that, that time on a Sunday morning, the church is still very divided. We walk into our churches, we're not seeing inclusive church. Um, we want the expectation of getting to know each other. And so that was fun. We had some activities. We told some stories. You guys remember, you draw your rivers. I want to tell you that a lot of the pastors in Pretoria are not very good artists. I, I have to be honest. Because <laughs> some of those did not look like rivers. I'm not sure what they drew. But... Um, but, but what is important is how people got to know stories. 
And there were some beautiful moments as people were reminiscing and thinking about the past. People were going, hey, I remember that guy. Oh, I remember that church. Oh, I, I remember going there. Remember, we did this together. Oh, were you? And, and suddenly, it's amazing the power of story as it emerged. What a richness of knowing each other. Uh, we want to cross the size divide in terms of different churches. Uh, you know, there, there's a church size. Uh, other expectation, Gerard, was establish and maintain relationships. So they were, we wanting to establish new relationships that happen around the table, but the idea of maintaining, I think it had one, Vase. Vase, ask his. You just blended in with everyone there and see you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so Hadman gave a great story of how you had started, even long before the bridge, Hadman had already started this process of inviting people to say, hey, let's have a coffee. And, um, and if I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, Hadman, uh, some people accepted it, but some didn't. And, and, and the, the sadness that you were full, and I remember, that's what I remember hearing, that Hadman was already establishing relationships, maintain it. How do we sustain this? I think Gerard and I, we've been talking a lot. This is great. We have wonderful days. This is fantastic what we're seeing here, but how do we sustain it going forward in terms of the bridge? And then the last one is that the expectation is a better plan for the future. The bridge is on a journey. We're on our way somewhere. We're moving towards a future, a preferred future. That's vision. Leaders have vision. But what does that future look like? That, that unity that we preach, this oneness in Christ. But someone needs to come up with a plan. And we, the collective, get to shape that. What is God's plan for Tswane? 20 words or less. So it's not a big, long story, but in 20 words, do we have anybody that would be able to say, I believe God's plan for 20 is in 20 words. Anybody? And imagine I'm going to give the mic to you now, and you need to answer. As you sit there, what would your answer be? What is God's plan for 20? Okay. Okay, greetings again. Um, I believe God's plan for Tswani is to see the church as one throughout the city and contributing to the body of Christ in preparing it for his coming, being the head himself. Thank you, Lucas. The next question is, why should we build bridges? And you should be ready for this one. This one is an easy one. Who's ready for me? Bridge guys? Don't smile. Answer. Because I believe that's in the Lord's heart, that when we build bridges and, 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 and move towards one another, that there will be a unity amongst us and the Lord can pour out His blessing amongst us. To me, it's very simple, and that is that God instructs us to be one. And therefore, that is what our mandate needs to be. We need to move past all these things that separate us from coming together. We need to bridge, to, to build these bridges as, as, as the church so that we can claim back our city, so that we can claim back um, whatever that God has given to Swan. We can't do that if we are, we are divided. Well, I might just add that we, we also said that if reconciliation is something that needs to eventually happen to the whole world, the story of South Africa and what the world thinks about South Africa and kind of looking at South Africa from all over the world saying, if you guys can do it, then surely reconciliation is possible. So we are on a world stage and we might as well just use the stage to do what God calls us all as Christians to do. We as church has got a testimony to the world outside. And the Bible says, by this people, with the love that we have among one another, the world will see that we are God's children. So let us testify. Let us do what God wants. As the church, we are the light and the salt of the world. 
It is the church that must lead. Most of the time we are led by politicians, but the church must take the upfront and lead. What roles what role will bring the best benefit to fix and change and develop Swane as it should be? Is it government? Anybody? There's one or two. Thank you. Business? Okay, there's here and there. NGOs? Are we NGOs in the house? Awesome, bless you. And then um, private sector? None? And then uh, we would clap for the church. So before we move on, I think you're right, sir. I think there's an element of truth in that. Yes, I mean, the church is the light. We are the hope of the world. But the church can't do it in isolation. And I think for too long, sometimes we try and do it in isolation. We need to come together and we need to say, right, how, do we, how do we take hands? So if we are the hope, then as the church, we need to take hands with the business and say, right, what's your role? How do we play together? The bridge. Then we need to take hands with the, 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 edu you know, the education system. We need to go to schools and we need to say, because our, our children are spending time both primary and high school, they're spending a lot of time in schools. Imagine them learning while they're at school as well, the importance of this, inclusivity. We need to take hands with the NGOs. Uh, and I'm wearing my NGO cap for a moment. We need to take hands with the NGOs and say, right, how do we work together? We need to take hands with the private sector. Because it's a concern for all of us, but as the church, we become the salt. We are the light. And as Jesus said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And as the church, we need to be infiltrating in business, in the private sector, in government, in NGO space, in the community, across the space, so that we can then be what Gerard's just put on the screen, so that we can then be the hope for the city. But we can't do it in isolation. We have to take hands, we've got to learn, and we've got to move forward. The consequences for not building bridges is because of a diverse, we will live a diverse, as a diverse nation, we will not be able to accomplish. Because it's, as the picture shows, it's an incomplete bridge. We will not be able to move over from the one side to the other side to enjoy what the other side have. So also the other side will move over to where I am on the other side, which shows that there is still a division. As soon as we can become divided, the consequences will be less and we will be able to enjoy the fruit of our works. Soli, um, if you are ready, after Pastor Peter and then... Uh, you know, I believe that uh, uh, reconciliation is the truth of the word of God. And when we take out our label as churches, black and what, but we work together as a church, then there will be great thing in South Africa. Amen. I just want to quickly say, there's a saying in Africa where it says it takes a village to raise a child. The question is, who is raising the village? And I believe this is the consequence of us as a church not building bridges is that there is no, no one that is raising the village. That is why we've seen the church being sidelined and where the church in the city no longer has a voice to give momentum and direction to where we need to go. Not even here in Tswane, but I think across the whole of South, South Africa. Now, the consequences for not building the bridges, to me, will nullify the preaching that we got. You know, from John 17, when Jesus said we must be one. I mean, we're not going to be one. Psalm 23, where God says he will direct his blessings upon us. If we are not united as Swane, we are not going to be blessed by God. You know, 
then, you know, we are, we are not going to be a blessed church. Thank you. Uh, we, we, we have to start somewhere. If we need to reconcile as a church, we need to start somewhere else. The unfortunately or fortunately, Tswane is the capital city. And God needs to use a capital city to reconcile. We need to be example to other provinces. That's why God brought us together, black and white and whatever color we are, so that we can start somewhere here. If we realize in Tswane, all these things happen in Tswane. Crime, uh, all these things that are happening in Tswane, that we talk about, everything happened in Tswane. Why? Because it's the capital city. God start to reconcile here in Swan. If we have to talk about the old stuff, we're not going to go forward. God brought us together, all of us here, because of God want to use Swan as a capital city. That's why we brought the black, white, everybody to come. I want us to start now. Of course, we cannot forget about what happened to, to our history. History, our history, we cannot forget about it. But we need to start a new page. All of us here. In this season, in this generation, all of us. We cannot stop uh, blaming one another all over. No, it's about time that we take a step of faith. We come together. We work to up the build, uh, building the bridges for Tswani. And the time is now. And the time is today. That's why we're here. I want to answer our pastor there on uh, his question. Yeah, just, just listen. Muruti, Muruti, just listen. The purpose is, first of all, we come together, which we have started. We've achieved that. Then, Heartlines sponsored a trip, which the invitation was for all the chairmen to go on a course of bridge building. If we must do the bridge building course today, the time will not be sufficient. The purpose of the bridge building was exactly what you were just raising, is to try and learn you how to bridge the difference between you and the other person, between we as different churches. Because we, even we as churches, we are divided. We are fighting and we are trying to proselyte members. So the purpose of the bridge, that's why they made clear, we are not a church. Their movement is not a church. They are facilitators. And they are trying to show by practical involvement how to get yourselves to bridge your divisions. We as the church. And if we can grow up, because if you can't bridge, you are not spiritually matured. The first sign that you are matured, you can live with differences. If you come there, you're still a baby in the Lord. So they are just trying to help us how to practically implement what we know we must do. That's all. I think the consequences of, of, of not building bridges is that could be that the church will be swallowed by ideologies like Pan-Africanism, nationalism, and the others. So what, what, what the, the, the group discussed in, in, in Maelstrom the other day was that in reconciliation, they, they identified that some churches were privileged. And then those churches were privileged to agree that in building bridges, they will come down to empower those underprivileged churches. And on that issue, everybody agreed. I just want to close off by saying, I've been to a conference where they also agreed that for, for the church to move forward, those people who have, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that the rich must give the poor. I'm simply saying that this is an outcome of the meeting that was at Maelstrom. I was hoping to see it there. I hope it will come out. When you were rating uh, leaders, I think you'll remember. Nord, Neville Norden was, was very prominent on that one. I hope you mentioned it. 
Can we play the clip, the Leadership Bridge clip, please? The Bridge Leadership Engagement is a unity building process targeting leaders of a particular system. Church leaders are being taken through this process so they can know each other, break down perceptions, and form partnerships in rebuilding cities, towns, and communities. Storytelling is done through the River of Life exercise, which has been instrumental in helping participants reflect deeper on their personal stories. How do I go there? I've lost, I've lost money, my, my, my son is on drugs, but he said we must go do mission work. So it was change of direction. We have to, to leave the house again in social media and stay in the and do mission work. Various tools are employed in order to highlight some of the social gaps that are prevalent among them. Once they have gone through these exercises, they are challenged to change the way they perceive one another from now on. Now what I'd like you to do is take a moment, just look around, look around the room. You've kind of had a look at the questions, you've looked at the story. What, is, what are some of the thoughts going through your mind as you see this now being kind of a room but now being represented in this way? I think this breaks down the, the barriers yeah. in our house. Now that I'm with Nevin here, yeah. and then like he says, our expectations would say, why is there? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. But then it tells you, unless you know the story, yeah. then mm. you will know. <laughs> so that means I need to hear Neville's story, because it's not all the perceptions that I have about where it is. Mm. There's more to learn. Mm. And then when you sit and listen to his story, you will understand that you are not only the one who suffered, somehow, somehow you also suffer, and that's why we are on the same page. Mm -hmm. And when we divided into rows, I was surprised to see certain people in certain places, but yet some of what we would think would be disadvantaged, God's grace has lifted them up. And uh, I see that the grace of God can bring the church together if we prepare to pray for one another, and love one another. I was challenged uh, to, on the issues of uh, my responsibility on closing the barriers, the racial barrier and the religious barrier, that in spite of whatever went through, I do have a responsibility to reach out and, and close that gap that is between us and different races and different races. You know, I have learned that I was not a good, I, I was not listening with understanding. I, I was listening to answer. But after he said sitting in the, in, in the room there, hearing to our leaders teaching us, how to listen, then I have learned that I'm, I'm not a good listener. Hearing some people's story, it's, it's, it's very crucial. Um, in this time and age, we, we, we are meeting people or we are fellowshipping on a pretty superficial level. And when I listen to other people's story, I realize that I might be talking to somebody that I needed to go and listen to their story first, deep. And that will make me a, to understand the people I am fellowshipping or relation or in contact with. is the parties involved in this topic, in this issue. Number three, what can the church, who's the church? Say, I am the church. You are the church. 
what can the church agree to do about it in your group? And then you're going to come back after lunch and you're going to tell us what we've talked at that table. And the Now 